welcome to the Transition Dialogue podcasts. My name is Alicia Pacevic. I'm an um, expert in education uh, at the Center for Citizenship Education in Poland. And uh, this is part of a project that we have started uh, some time ago with the participation of uh, countries from the uh, Eastern and Central Europe that have gone through transition from communism to, yes, we don't know exactly how to call the period we are in. Some countries say transition has ended in the 90s, it began in 1989 in Poland, but then went through the whole uh, Eastern and Central Europe. And uh, some people say it has ended in the 90s or in the moment when some of our countries entered the European Union. But there are others who are saying that we are still in transition. And uh, it's very interesting and insightful to look into the period that we are going through. This is a very unique experience, the generational experience of not only one generation, the one that has brought um, the transition into life, but also all the um, generations that came later and are living the consequences of the, the trans political, social, economic transformation. This is the sort of a dream come true, not only from the political perspective of the a fall of communism, but also a sort of a dream come true for a historian, for a social psychologist, for a sociologist, this big wave of changes that happened uh, here is really something completely unique and not so easy to uh, understand. Some people call it a self-limiting revolution. Others say it was just, you know, one of the many social changes that uh, the humanity went through. Whatever the perspective you take, it's incredible to look into how in our countries, in different countries, in Poland, Lithuania, Germany, Bulgaria, Russia, Ukraine, how it was done. And what are the big differences between our different ways of transition, but also what are the similarities, the general patterns that we can observe. But the goal of the um, Transition Dialogue Project is not really to find the historical truth about transition. It's more about teaching transition and talking on transition, how the knowledge and perceptions of transition are formed and how they are then uh, spread and what is the relation, for example, between public discourse on uh, what has happened in our countries and uh, how it's then taught in the schools. So why are we doing this? We are doing this to really become more aware of uh, how transition is, is and can be uh, taught and can be debated in the schools and in informal settings in our countries while using the incredible opportunity to have a sort of a cross-border angles. That's why we are inviting you to a series of podcasts, Transition Dialogues, uh, in which we will dialogue about uh, three important topics. I'd like to invite you to the podcast on winners and losers of transition. Uh, dear Elena, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Hello, Nora. Nice <laughs> to hear you, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah. 
So we need to, we, we are here to discuss some transition topics as I understand. <laughs> we are here to discuss not only one transition topic, but the most important uh, transition topic, which is winners and losers of transition. Yeah, Alena, cool. would, you, would you consider yourself a winner of transition? I think I'm completely winner of transition <laughs> because I can freely, freely move around uh, everywhere when it's not COVID time, of course. <laughs> and I, I can read freely, I can meet people without any problems. And I think for me, it's, it, it means that uh, Soviet past is the past and I can be free to do what I want. And for me, it's transition, transition wins in my case. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think most people would agree that the younger generation, so what we called in our previous project, generation of transition, everybody who was still in school uh, when um, 1990, 1991 happened, or who was uh, even before school, <laughs> that they are definitely the, the, the winners of transition because they got to experience a complete new life, new possibilities, new freedoms. Um, I, 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 I wonder who's losers then? Who's losers? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Who's losers? Well, mm, I, for... I, I have one mind. I have one category in mind. And you have one category me. in mind, let me yeah. know. Uh, it's about, you know, all this uh, generation of people who started working working in um, system in official system for example in culture like in libraries in houses of culture in all these networks around around those i think these people they used to this stable life and that they know what to do and uh, what is their career path and for them, uh, losing uh, this uh, th this part of their life, it's me it's, it means just uh, changes without any uh, future understanding of what what it will be. So for them, I, for them, I think it's something that they lose really this stability. Yeah. And this kind of people, maybe they are losers in that dimension. And for you. Who is, yeah, um, well, I think I don't really like the word loser because especially in English, uh, it sounds, you know, as if you're on top of the fact that people lost something, you're also <laughs> calling them bad names, uh, which I don't think we should. But um, yeah, I, I think in the case of, of the GDR, it's exactly what you say. Um, I even looked up some numbers before. I think in the GDR, there were like almost 4 million people who um, one way or the other worked for, for the state or for state-owned enterprises. And of them, uh, more than half actually lost their job after, after 90, 1990. And um, also, of course, all those people who worked in the state security organs, which in case for the GDR, it was 300,000 people. And they, of course, not only lost their job, but actually they were afterwards, uh, rightly or not rightly, uh, I think it depends on the on the person and on the case, but they were also criminalized yeah, for their lives. So not only were their lives uh, worthless, they maybe even had to had to deal, had to come to terms with the fact that they might have done something bad, yeah, with their lives. So, in one day, they were achieved uh, members of society, and in, on the next day, they were even villains. So, yeah, I think it was similar for yeah. Ukraine and for Soviet Union. Or, but maybe, and maybe you, not that much. You're right. it for you, actually. Yeah, and actually, I did interview with one guy who used to be the uh, uh, KGB, uh, some high rank person, uh, ranking person. Like, um, he had this honor to be in KGB, and he told that, you know, I. I serve my country and my country was Soviet Union. And so for him, it really was uh, like a disaster because his country is disappear. Yeah, I was disappear. Yeah. So for him, it's uh, like personal tragedy because he uh, said that uh, he like part of him doesn't doesn't exist anymore. 
Yeah, I think um, right. the case of GDR is quite particular because in our uh, in our transformation story, winners and losers, West and East, they clashed uh, right within one country. Yeah, even right within one city uh, here in Berlin. And I think that also made um, created some aspects that maybe in Ukraine you don't have some, for instance, about um, East German university degrees or professional uh, degrees yeah, that people would be a bit frowned upon, like, OK, you have like a less uh, less education. It's, it's not that much worth like a Western education. Um, for instance, now you can also see that in public debate when people like to talk about, oh, what was Angela Merkel's like uh, doctor's thesis? And <laughs> that's a bit funny because uh, everything that happened in the GDR is something like kind of exotic and mysterious and maybe even suspicious. And what did these people do there when they were traveling to Moscow or St. Petersburg during their studies? Whoa, it's like something so from a different planet. And to me, that's kind of absurd because that was just the reality of lives of uh, one third of, of Germany and basically half of Europe. So why to make it, you know, into something less and into something exotic? So maybe that's a bit further than, than winners and losers, but yeah, that's also part of the discussion that we have here. I listened to one podcast from the USA and guys told about this Terman, uh, Terman guy who, uh, who discovered the first musical instrument, uh, electronical one. This, uh, you know, this is a ter Terman Vox. That is, uh, you uh -huh. can uh, play with your hands. And uh, he was the KGB, KGB agent and he presented to uh, the Amer American ambassador, US ambassador in Moscow, uh, some present with pioneers, uh, by pioneers. Uh, and they present some uh, eagle or something like this, but he, uh, it, eagle has some uh, spine device inside that works uh, mm -hmm. without any electricity. It was like uh, something uh, innovative. And they discovered it only after seven years. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what is funny that these guys from the USA, they say, you know, and after that case, I never uh, believe in pioneers. I always thought that they are spies, all of them. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, yeah, that, that, that uh, Western, uh, Western uh, understanding of uh, all this uh, uh, say territory, who, uh, these people who lived here in the post-Soviet in Soviet time, uh, mm -hmm. for them, uh, all these people was kind of spy in any case, mm -hmm. <laughs> even it's not true. <laughs> but yeah. what, what, yeah, your story also refers to the quality of education. So if they were <laughs> able to make such uh, advanced devices, education could not have been so bad <laughs> for these for these uh, yeah. Great, yeah, great people were everywhere, like and now also. I assume that you would say it's not done with transition, but let us know. I, I love this answer that one of my respondents gave me after I asked that, uh, that question, actually. And this um, person said that, uh, for me, transition is not done till the moment when people in all official structures, like services, uh, will smile. Because now <laughs> nobody smiles. And this is like Soviet past, uh, like pushing on them in the past and they're so sad so i think transition is not done in ukraine in, but uh, at the same time uh, we always have some changes and uh, less and less we have remind th things that remind a soviet past because it's already 30 years uh, after and it's yeah. a lot of time. I think it's it's the time itself changed the situation. And what in, in the case with Eastern Germany, actually, what can you share yeah. about this? I, I really like this idea about smiling in public institutions. <laughs> but I think for uh, Germans, we are more uh, serious and more focused on, on hard facts. So I guess for us, I think um, transition or unification would be over in the case when there is really a equal standard of living and equal um, opportunity to participate in society. Because it's still the case, for instance, maybe people in Eastern Europe will not even 
know about it or won't think about it, but uh, salaries, for instance, are lower in Eastern Germany in comparison to Western. Pensions are lower, even life expectancy is lower, and there's much less possibility for employment. Um, there's less uh, industries there. Uh, infrastructure is um, in, in many, especially rural areas, in a bad shape. So, yeah, we do not have a real equality here. And the question is really also what would be what would be the goal? Yeah, what would be the end the end goal? You say it should be it should be smiles on people's faces. I, I agree with that. But um, if un unification, yeah, for the case of Germany, we always have this this bigger half that we have to compare ourselves with. And so our goal would be to be equal, to have equal chances, to have uh, equal possibility for political participation. And in this sense, we have a very long way to go because we're just two, two generations behind. <laughs> the East Germans uh, didn't, didn't take part in a race happening for two generations. And of course, now we are very much in the back. And also, I think many East Germans, they didn't even understand what uh, what is the race that's happening there? What are the rules of the games? What do they have to do? And they're just slowly understanding it and yeah, taking part. <laughs> I think in our case, it's uh, actually, to be, if, to be serious, it's corruption itself because it's, uh, uh -huh. it has a uh, huge influence on all, uh, on all, uh, uh, how to say, spheres, yeah, spheres of our yeah. life. Uh, and uh, we have uh, corrupted uh, the, the, the worst. It's uh, our justice system is corrupted. So you can't catch anybody, even you will. Uh, they just uh, give freedom to such people. So, uh, and from this point, you can't change anything in the country and for better than the justice system itself is corrupted. So I think uh, it's so important for Ukraine to really moved on with this corruption issue. If we will have changes here, it will be already a huge uh, achievement of transition. So we are hoping. But, but why, why do you think corruption is still such a big issue? I mean, it's quite natural yeah, that it developed in the 90s. But why 30 years on and you had how many revolutions? Two, three in Ukraine? I stopped counting. I just think that because we didn't have, uh, we didn't have real, real clearance of the system. So we have the same people who used to be in Soviet time. They were Komsomols uh, or uh, party people. And after that, they stayed in the, par in the system and they mm -hmm. just um, adapting. And uh, all this old generation, they bring new people who they teach how to do all this stuff. I, I remember my shock then I, and I, uh, I, I, I went to the university and uh, everybody there told me that like, you need to learn how to give bribes to, <laughs> to have good marks on your exams. And for me, it was shock, like, you know, for young, for young person, just after school, uh, then you know that honesty and the uh, and really uh, brave heart it means a lot uh, here that to hear that uh, it's not it's mean nothing in this world uh, world so i think uh, uh, this system it's really like uh, needs some clearance and i think it's some it can be done only if we will clear first this justice system because how you can catch catch anybody on corruption if they mm -hmm. uh, stay free uh, they just can run away and uh, this is the problem so we move uh, but so slow <laughs> not as yeah. Poland or Germany we are unfortunately yeah, not so we, happy yet we moved kind of too fast <laughs> for many people now say we moved too fast but if we have a look uh, to to countries of the no like Ukraine or the former Soviet Union other countries uh, it's really, we, we can see what would have happened if we didn't have this uh, bigger West Germany uh, to unite with, that we can now, all our negative emotions, we can just blame on them. 
but um, yeah, if you don't have this this partner for transition, of course there are a lot of um, much worse uh, issues that are coming with it, and maybe even more people who turn into losers of transition. I uh, read the survey, and actually most of the East Germans nowadays, three uh, three decades later, they consider themselves winners. <laughs> so actually, everybody in East Germany now, even the ones who maybe had a bad time or suffered from losses in the 90s now I think more or less the majority of people consider themselves winners and I'm not sure if that applies for Ukraine for example yeah I think it's not the work I think actually what is also we need to mention that uh, we had this uh, time after uh, Soviet uh, dis disappearance yeah that uh, we had this pri privatization and uh, then uh, everybody received a little part of the country yeah, for himself. Yeah, and the they vouchers. had the vouchers, yeah, and uh, all Great these vouchers. <laughs> yeah, and all vouchers was uh, bought for nothing from the people. And uh, all these uh, people who bought these vouchers, they they now oligarchs, yeah, yeah. and they received factories. So in any case, we have this feeling like big somebody uh, smarter, bigger came and took our future from us. So I think here we are on the same page, like East Germans think about West Germans, uh, yeah. that they took their perspectives uh, we have this uh, uh, understanding that maybe our oligarchs took everything from us but i think maybe with a little but significant difference that these oligarchs are you know people from your own country <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how sure. to interpret it but it's still like the like you have this uh, if you want to call it an enemy you have it uh, within your country and I think the story with the voucher it goes very much to the to the core of the question of winners and losers because we had this very strange situation that in socialist or communist countries um, everything belonged to everybody so all all factories uh, the whole infrastructure of the state was the property of everybody and then was the task how to um, yeah how to transform this property of everybody into property of one concrete person and in germany we had this approach with the agency called treuhand trust agency who was basically selling this uh, yeah this state property to everybody who wanted to buy it and actually the soviet approach to to divide these vouchers in this sense it was more just because you were a worker in a factory and here you go you receive the voucher <laughs> to your own factory yeah? i don't know what do you think would you have preferred this uh, german approach with private companies coming and and buying the industries I think uh, that in uh, any case, uh, in your in your situation, it's more clear and it's uh, um, you see results. They are better, really. So um, I think in uh, in case then you receive your voucher and you you are not educated how to use it. You never thought about you you didn't know about economy at all. Anything like yeah. you know you you living all your life. On a, like a factory worker or uh, some kolkhoz uh, worker uh, like from the village and uh, you never thought about uh, this as a perspective so you just give it for free or even worse uh, somebody will come and took it from your with uh, the some guys with uh, military and guys mm. yeah or uh, bandits so uh, i think it's more honest to be uh, to, to, to really give opportunity to companies to buy and to, in that case money is coming to the government and you have something in the budget in uh, so maybe because i have this experience uh, from my from my country it's, mm -hmm. it's not it was not so successful yeah, sometimes I wonder what would have happened in the case of the GDR because uh, between this um, like the fall of the wall and what we now call a reunification, there was this period where there was so much um, 
democratic activity in the GDR. Yeah, people uh, really began to organize themselves at their workplace, in the factories, uh, in the schools. There was a lot of like democracy uh, on a small level happening. And I really wonder sometimes if people would have been giving these vouchers, maybe they would have even, you know, organized like um, communal way to uh, to run their business together or something like that. Yeah, it's just sometimes I wonder if, if a bit more time for for experiments <laughs> might have might have brought us uh, some, uh, yeah, interesting interesting cases for today, more sustainable. Um, there were more questions here, Alena. For example, yes, let's try. What were the biggest successes for Ukraine in transition? Uh, I, I think the biggest uh, for, for Ukraine is the freedom of speech. Uh, because in com if you compare it with uh, Belarus, for example, mm -hmm. or other countries, uh, freedom of speech is not so um, freedom, freedom, yeah, <laughs> they, and uh, it's uh, really influenced. And uh, in our case also, I think it's great that we have a different uh, clans or I don't know of different uh, 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 parties uh, that they have interest in Ukraine and we don't have uh, one monolith uh, monolith uh, uh, leader who will be like a king for a country so we always yeah. have this opportunity for revolutions for changes because uh, so multi perspective perspectivity is multi perspectivity is present in our life yeah and uh, yeah. that's freedom of speech and freedom of uh, movement is uh, the most important thing that we receive other things maybe is not so great and what is what is what what do you think about germany yeah, I completely agree that, sure, freedom of speech, I mean, for our generation, it's really hard to imagine how, how to live without it, basically, freedom of movement, freedom also to choose your profession, yeah, because in the GDR, you could not just become whatever you wanted, you had to follow, follow a certain path that was meant for you. And I think also for, for Germany, which is kind of, yeah, after Poland, of course, we have our Polish colleagues here, maybe listening, um, is the country where transition began and um, the peacefulness of the transition, I think, is the biggest success for, for the East German case. And I would like to point out that it's not only peacefulness from sides of protesters, but also from, uh, from the side of the, of the government, of the security organs, because in our 90... 89 everybody had the the pictures and stories from from china in front of their eyes where there were also huge protests and they were brutally beaten down so i think in in 89 in germany nobody could be really sure that this wasn't about to happen people knew that this was kind of an option and they were afraid and i think both sides were afraid <laughs> And yeah, and that everything stayed peaceful. I think that's that's the biggest um, uh, the biggest luck and um, the greatest success that we have for for the transition of the GDR. They might have been kind of a wild and in many places rough time, but there was no hunger, uh, there was no very severe poverty. There was no like criminal activities so out of hands as they were in, in Ukraine or Russia or other parts of the former Soviet Union. So I think uh, overall the successes <laughs> were overweigh the shortcomings that we might have had. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, you really uh, you really have the be best scenario that can be in such situation. Ah, I wanted to add something about, about losers of transition, because um, 
all of this uh, yeah discussion of of losers and of being overprivileged the east germans have this feeling um of course that's also um a reason for the success of of right wing parties here in in germany um many people vote for right wing populist parties also out of kind of a feeling that um, they have not been given a political voice uh, they do not have a political elite that kind of speaks for them and rep represents themselves and in this case i think losers of this transition is uh, are we all and our our democracy um because of this if these parties gain more support it's it's bad not only for for east germany but also for for europe in general and and for our neighbors <laughs> like ukraine so yeah winners and and losers of transition might even be there where we le least expect it because uh, these uh, consequences of uh, of what happened in these 30 years they affect everybody in the end if you could decide what what should happen to ukraine in 1991 do you think that you could find a way to make to make something better then then it happened finally or do would you give some advice maybe to to those in charge in these days ah nice question uh i think it's uh, really important to have such support from other countries uh, to yeah. have maybe extra education it, that's what i think is most important for the starters uh, who people who start some new life and after this uh, disappearing of soviet uh, actually structure uh, it was i think important to educate people how to live a new life how to live in this free world and this is uh, this is if I if I could <laughs> choose such a scenario, the best way is to make some programs and to educate people to give some time for a country, I don't know, a year or two, three, to start new new life, and uh, then then it can work better, much better. But mm. but to be honest, uh, it's so hard to change yourself and how we can imagine to change all this whole society it's a long way you can do it in, in just in one moment it's always generations and generations so we it's it's really took some generations few generations to create soviet person yeah and yeah. now it's it will be a few generations to create new people <laughs> capitalist persons <laughs> I don't know if it's something that we should look forward to. <laughs> Maybe you tell me, uh, Aliana, if you say that, yeah, it can't happen from, from one second to the next, this transition, and it was a very tough job for, for these generations that had to go through it. Would there be a transition that maybe awaits our generation that could be just as, as uh, intense and how could it look like? Where where could we be transitioning towards? I think we are, we make a transition from this society with uh, borders to whole world society, a global one, uh, with uh, some uh, per vertical perspective, like like you told it, Mars perspective. Uh, we will be absolutely different in future, and uh, all this information changes what we have now it will create new person we are overwhelmed by information so i think it will be new kind new countries and it will be maybe one whole nation i don't know i i don't see this uh, nationalistic ideas in the future to be honest so much because it will be new planets <laughs> how we can say that i'm um, German or I'm Namibian or anywhere, anybody, if uh, you're going to Mars, for example. Yeah, <laughs> that uh, sounds like, like a pretty exciting outlook to have. And, uh, and what for you? What is for you? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> for me, um, well, to say what could have 
been done uh, better, maybe first of all, in case of of, uh, of the GDR transition. Um, I think it's really these. Um, yeah, the first question is actually who could have done something better because. I think that the, the problem was that people were so used to having a clear political actor who's acting on, on their behalf and driving things into a certain direction. And suddenly this shifted from uh, from one clear from ship that, that steers into one direction to um, yeah, to many different actors who had different interests in mind and, and followed through with them. So I don't know what what could be the advice, but I think what people were were lacking in this period that also refers to what you said, Elena, is uh, is ownership both of the political process to have the feeling to be involved, to have the feeling to to being able to to shape something, to have influence on on your surroundings, on your everyday surroundings, and not feeling uh, powerless. Um, and the other aspect of ownership is, of course, also ownership of, of property. Yeah, so this is why I like this idea with the vouchers. I mean, in the end, the individual <laughs> voucher was, was worthless, but it was at least um, some kind of an attempt. Maybe not a super a well thought through attempt, but it was an attempt to kind of just uh, divide this property that that was there and give people a chance to organize it for themselves and um yeah for for future transition uh, i can i can only <laughs> join you in saying that i that i hope that um this um yeah globalization information overflow uh, hyper mobility that it leads us uh, somewhere good I think we we are still in the process where we can also shape that and influence that. And now with the pandemic, I think it gives us a good good uh, point and momentum to kind of also think about where where we're heading, and if if we actually have have with us on our way everything we need. So yeah, I think it's it's great that we have this opportunity to do podcasts like this. Well, and, uh, I, I want to reflect on what's happening. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add maybe from the perspective of this voucher and your feelings that it can be better. Uh, I think it's so important to not be slave, you know, in your mind. And after this uh, time, to, so not time be, to not be what? Afraid? Slave, slave, like, you know, ah, slavery. slave. Ah, yeah. yeah, so I think we, uh, to, we need to change our mindsets and uh, to be flexible and to develop ourselves. Then we will be not the Soviet people anymore, you know. We can learn how to use such vouchers. We can learn how to live free life, really. And this yeah. is important. Aliana, did you want to add something? Oh, I think uh, that it's wonderful to learn story, to, to learn from stories, and uh, to be more, you know, how to say, smart or for future. So I hope our future transition will be better. <laughs> and you, Nora, thank you actually for this conversation very much. And thank how, you very much. Better. This podcast was part of a Transition Dialogue project. Transition Dialogue, dealing with change in democratic ways. The project is financed by the Federal Agency for Civic Education as uh, implemented by a consortium of partners, um, including Sofia Platform from Bulgaria, Stiftung Wissen am Werk and Institute of Social Sciences, Ivo Pilar from Croatia, Open Lithuania Foundation from Lithuania, Center for Citizenship Education from Poland, a Congress of Cultural Activists from Ukraine, and the Museum of the Victims of uh, Totalitarianism from Perm, Russia. Our common work is coordinated by Deutsch-Russischer Austausch, from Berlin.